are now tuned in to the OSINT Curious Podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's version of the OSINT Curious Webcast. I'm here, Michael Hoffman, with a really special guest, Nico, and some other special guests as well. well this week is really is special for us. We've got Sector 035 on voice. Say hi, Sector. Say hi, Sector. Hello, everybody. Cool. And Nico? Hi, everybody. And then our very special guest, which we're really happy to have, Chris Kubeka. Hi, everyone. Yeah. So uh, whether you are on uh, po- are listening to us via podcast or you're, you're looking at us on YouTube, uh, welcome to you. Thanks for coming. And we also have several attendees that are, are uh, here uh, in person. And uh, we actually have Ginsburg 5150 who's joining us in just a moment as well. This week, we've got a, a lot to go through. So we're going to just kind of jump right into some news if that's all right with everybody. All right, so uh, uh, the past two weeks, we had a blog post that went out. This was by our roving reporter, Josh Huff, uh, Beowulf88. He put this uh, really neat blog post out about uh, what happens when you find content that is a little bit uh, sensitive or you find bad stuff or you just want to report a bad account like uh, something somebody that's spreading hate or violence. Check it out on our OSINT Curious blog post. Uh, it's called OSINT for Good, Reporting the Bad. Now, this is Chris Kubeka. Um, Chris, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and get into the news, but can you tell us a little bit about yourself just right off the bat, your background? I see some in your bio here, but can you tell us who you are and what kind of things you do that are OSINT? Okay. Um, my background is uh, predominantly in offensive security, and I started with the U.S. Air Force and moved into Space Command and uh, in the private sector ended up at uh, Unisys and then heading uh, the uh, Information Protection Group, uh, Joint Intelligence Group, and Network and Security Operations Center for Aramco overseas for the EMEA and Latin American regions, minus uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And most recently, I have opened my own company after leaving the Aramco family. And I generally concentrate uh, OSINT-wise a lot more on systems and trying to get information out of various types of systems. And I also uh, use some of those uh, techniques, but on a larger scale um, for um, looking at uh, different types of uh, cyber warfare incidents that I've been involved with because it all plays a part of how uh, companies, organizations, and countries are attacked. Excellent. Well, welcome, as I said, to the show. Uh, we actually, uh, I, I love the, the kind of OSINT that you're doing uh, because I know that a lot of our audience aren't tracking people, aren't tracking, you know, sentiments on or hashtags or terrorist groups. They're, they're, they're red teamers and blue teamers and just people that are out there protecting networks in general. So I'm um, really looking forward to hearing you uh, later on in the broadcast. Talk, show us a little bit about some of the things that you know and Excellent. that you've written up in a book. Excellent. Cool. So, um, and as always, you know, please uh, participate here. Please uh, chime in. Uh, for those of you that are on the webcast, go ahead and use your Q and A, the Q and A thing, to send us messages. If you're online right now, uh, go ahead and hashtag, uh, post to us, tweet to us, and we will uh, take your questions as well. Let's talk about some news. Nico, I think this was yours, right? Agent of Influence 2.0. You wanted to talk about this? Um, well, it got my attention because, well, almost every time when the Grok makes an article, he want to read it just because he always goes in depth and he's fairly on point on what he states online. But this caught my uh, particular interest because uh, he's pointing out there's um, more and more people being used for, uh, let's say, fake news or influencing information, amplification of information, um, set you off on the the wrong foot. So it's 
really interesting to read, especially when you conduct open source intelligence, because you might just read an article that has been amplified by, let's say, a nation state actor, just to make you want to read that particular article and get you a certain amount of bias in your mind and not may being able to making the right decisions anymore you're being influenced so i thought it was really interesting to look at information from this point of perspective and especially uh the grog stating that this 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 is a new technique not 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 a new technique but a technique more and more being used by agencies or governments to influence the vast majority of people yeah and this is on uh for those of you the article that we're pulling up and we'll put all of this in our show notes and on our website uh is from 2016 actually but like you said it's highly relevant uh, in 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 some of the discussions that i've had with some people recently we started talking about social media and how when you actually post something even if it's totally wrong People are going to retweet it or like it or share it or whatever it is, depending on the platform. And then that goes out. Even if the original post gets edited or deleted, those remnants sometimes can can keep continue on. And if people if it gets people tweeting them or or reposting or sharing, um, many times that wave is enough to to influence people, regardless of whether it's truthful information or not. Yeah, exactly. And I was pointing to the article of uh, the Grog because I was pointed, I was looking at an article of Ars Technica, which pointed to this article, just to be precise. We'll put that link in the show note also. Okay. And that's does, one anybody of... else, does anybody else listen to Recorder Feature? No. no. So Recorder Feature uh, is pretty good, and they do a lot more threat intel stuff, and they actually just had the Grok on talking about um, influence campaigns. So it mirrored this article. Uh, it was their episode 100 thing, so it was kind of a special deal. So it was super interesting. So if anybody has um, any <clears throat> interest in Thread Intel or just listening to him talk, which I always think is a good thing, uh, yeah, a Recorder Feature had a really good, I think it was episode 100, where yeah. they just dove right into this stuff. Yeah, I listened to it. I listened to it on the CyberWire. They copied yeah, yeah. the whole yeah. episode from Recorder Feature. It's, it's well worth uh, listening to it. Yep. Okay. Well, let's look at uh, something a little different. This is from Brenna Smith. I thought we talked about Brenna Smith another time with one of her other Bellingcat things. Is that right? Yes, we did. But she did a new article on cryptocurrencies. So last time we um, applauded her for her awesome article in depth on how to conduct um, um, open source intelligence and track illicit goods. And now she made a second article which... Um, lets you uh, find out how to trace illegal funding of campaigns by cryptocurrencies. So I thought it was really interesting because people always find it hard to track financial goods, especially when it comes to cryptocurrencies. So this gives you some real good pointers on where to start, how to look, and which state of mind you can use for looking at these specific data points. Yeah. So, again, Brenna, applause for you. Well done. So, uh, um, Justin Seitz was a guest on our show about a month ago, I'd say, and he mentioned a book by Nick Furneaux, uh, in invest Investigating Cryptocurrencies. And, well, I got it. I started reading it. I started flagging things in there. And so There's a lot of tabs in there. You already got some, uh, some stuff, some right. marks in there, yeah? Well, and one of the contributors to this book, who um, da uh, who Nick mentions, is uh, Dave Holzler, who's an amazing SANS instructor um, and just extremely smart guy. And I got his yeah. I got his autograph. Nice, um, nice. I feel special. You know? Yeah, right. you should. But Fanboy. I am I totally, <laughs> man, totally. I, I'm, um, but uh, this is terrific. I mean, this is really good, and I love seeing. The not just again, uh, she does a great job of, of not just throwing websites at you, but she's telling you the thought process behind there. Um, terrific, well done, Brenna. Done again. Moving on to MW OSINT, 
Uh, yeah, this blog post was in or this uh, post was interesting where uh, MWO sent on a train was listening to all the different things that uh, a, a fellow traveler was saying. And then after a while, started doing some research on them and then uh, brought it up to the person because I think it was an hour long commute or something. And then uh, brought it up to them that that, uh, hey, do you know that you probably shouldn't be sharing all this because look at all the things I got. What are your thoughts about that, guys? I mean, it moves into the realm of kind of, it moves into the realm of creepy for me, right? I mean, uh, but effective, I think. Yeah. Well, I recognize it. I think it's professional deformation or something. Uh, when, I, when I commute, you just shoulder people and you... Yeah. Shoulder surf them? You're like you're watching what they're doing? Yeah. yeah, yeah I, I just can't unsee certain things i just see <laughs> those things exactly yeah, things that people are doing in the commute in amsterdam i mean come on yeah, yeah. So, and so then this, i was i was gonna say this this brings up a lot of the stuff that i was doing with passive research on telephone numbers uh you know and especially in the states here or whatever any place you go to for any uh marketing rewards program or anything else whatever if you forget your special little card that gives you your discount they'll allow you to go through and tag it to your telephone number so just standing in line to go through and get an auto part or get your groceries or get anything else, uh, really people are just handing out, you know, the keys to their kingdom in regards to a lot of the stuff that's tied digitally to their the physical space. Um, so <clears throat> this is the same type of, of, of passive, you know, intelligence gathering that you can be doing, you know, it's not very targeted, which is okay, but as, as a, as a uh, crime of opportunity, you know, this is something where like a, a malicious actor could go through and say, okay, now I've got this on you. Now I can go through and pivot off this and I've got everything that's, that's available to me open source. So yeah, those type of things I think is what we make aware of is, is a better thing than having someone who's malicious say, oh, well, I'm just going to use that now on you. So I don't know. It's, it is in the creepy realm, but at the same time, like attack to defend. That's kind of the thing, you know? Yeah, and I also think it points out um, how to keep your own operational security in mind at all times, because you might just have that one unattended moment where people can shoulder you and find out that really valuable stuff about you or your company, and you get compromised. Yeah, yeah I was on a plane one time, and you know the person sitting next to me or in front of me or something, or I forget where they, uh, I was looking, I, I got up to the men's room or something. And I looked down at their laptop or over the seat and there's a document and the document had some banners, some headers and footers that are very popularly used in the intelligence community. And I'm like, you're doing this on a plane. You're, you're looking at this document on your special laptop on a plane. This is not the place, but you know, I, I'm not sure that I, I, I feel comfortable necessarily going up there and going, hey, I think that there's a spelling error on page two of that document. You know, I, that would help them out, I'm sure, but um, it, that, again, puts their focus on me. Uh, you know, it's that it's that no good deed goes unpunished. Like in here, uh, uh, Matthias goes through and he says, you know, at one point, it's like, excuse me, Dr. Miller, may I ask you a question? That puts the the this innocent person who's sharing too much on the defensive right off the bat. Um, but what about you, Chris? Would you uh, ever tap a person and say, hey, you know, you just told me this whole conversation about how you're, what, and you have cancer and you're on the phone with your doctor or your friend, whatever. Would you ever tell them uh, you're sharing too much in public? Oh, you're muted. There. Yeah, I've actually seen this a few years ago in the Washington, D.C. metro station. Uh, there's a lot of government employees, and many times they even have their badges open, also being unprotected, and uh, then start talking about certain things or uh, looking at certain things that they shouldn't. And um, I, I've, uh, I actually reported one particular one uh, uh, regarding a, a high-level government employee because uh, I've photo I took a picture of a foreign national photographing the the things that he was looking at. Oh my. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, for all it takes is to ride the Metro or the, where the train or the bus or whatever to get into work and you can videotape everything now. Exactly. It's really interesting stuff. I get you. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. 
Um, so moving from the realm of sharing too much to the realm of sharing too much in a certain location, um, you like that segue? I practiced it for hours. Uh, Nico, you want to talk about Mar-a-Lago and what happened over there with a super uh, secret well, agent? I don't know the specific because I just took a glance at this article. Um, I'm, from what I heard from the news, there was an Asian woman trying to get into uh, his holiday, the holiday home of uh, Trump, if I'm right, and correct me if I'm wrong. Mar-a-Lago is like his resort that he goes to ah. very, very, very frequently. And a yeah. lot of other people that are in power go to very frequently too, yeah. But this person, this individual, didn't have quite as good as an alibi like she hoped to have from what I've read in the media. And she had also had some devices or at least a USB stick um, with, yeah. we don't know what on it and I don't know what the plans are, but people say this might be a spy trying to get in and penetrate the systems and all nah. that stuff. It can't be a spy. She's just a normal traveler having uh, four cell phones, a laptop, an external hard drive type of device and a thumb drive. I mean, pff, that sounds like every time I travel, I'm carrying four different cell phones, right? And it's just, two yeah, passwords. And two passwords, whatever. You know. yeah, Don't worry about it. You're connected. Yeah, what if you lose the first one, Ginsburg? Right. Redundancies. I mean, it makes sense. Right. But, I mean, it brings up an excellent point of, hey, this is uh, – and, 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 you know, understanding who's in these locations. And, and now with Mar-a-Lago being a very uh, – a place where a lot of interesting concepts concerning the United States government are, are talked about. Um, yeah, the surveillance, even blatant stuff like this is very interesting. So the thing that I want to add on to this as well is that there was a, there was a very prominent person uh, that was getting selfies and stuff like that with President Trump. Uh, this was a, maybe a month ago. Her name was Cindy Lee or Lang, I think is it was. Is that the massage lady? Yes, so that was the person who she owned uh, the massage parlors, or at least the chain that Robert Kraft was was caught doing something. She had sold those, um, and so she was not the proprietor at the time, but she had gone on to open a consulting business that would bring Chinese nationals and executives over to try to meet President Trump. Um, so even from an open source intelligence type of uh, investigation. If we know that there's someone who has an end there, and they even mentioned it in this article, she said that she had a diplomatic meeting with the Cindy Lang at one point, try to use that as her pretext, maybe for, let's say it's a social engineering engagement. So just knowing that there is someone who's already linked there gives you the pretext to go through and just, you know, walk onto the ground type of thing, whatever. So it's interesting to see how these kind of roll together and see what other people may be using you know, our own media intelligence, whatever, against us in regards to that stuff. Plus, this is not a this is not a federally protected place. It does have Secret Service and stuff there that are assigned to the place, but this is not, you know, this is not a place that would, this is a resort. This has travelers going through it all the time. This is, this is not a place that is locked down or hardened at all. So, or m more than the Secret Service is allowed to do, I should say, because they do a good job, so. Yeah, and I mean, you just said exactly what's written in the article. It says, while the Secret Service does not determine who's permitted to enter the club, their agents and officers conduct physical screenings. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, what would be um, what I did for a couple of customers a long time ago was set up some uh, Bluetooth monitoring, Wi Fi monitoring devices focused at like the entrance and exit of a garage and just track all of the different devices that went into and out of that garage on a daily basis. When they went in, when they went out, take pictures of license plates and people and stuff, just monitoring, just uh, purely not interacting. And then making that wonderful Multigo graph or Gephi graph of, hey, this person comes at this frequency and, and is always there when this person's there. Um, doing that for Mar-a-Lago or any of the other places that uh, our leadership goes to could be very interesting and very osint -y. All right. Oh, moving from the creepy to the creepier. Here we have Facebook. Yes. Oh, this reminds me of something. So uh, uh, this is an article. Uh, Nico, was this you again? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, Facebook demanding some new users' email passwords. You want to talk about that? 
<laughs> well, I don't even want to talk about Facebook anymore. <laughs> but, but this was especially creepy because they actually are asking for your passwords now. And not the password of your Facebook account, but for the email account you want to sign up with to Facebook, that specific password they ask for you. So I was like, mind is blown again by the tricks of the trade that Mark uses on us to gain or to farm us all, basically. So yeah. this was just outrageous. And, and, and I think it's strange that people are so used to facebook doing these kind of things or these i can call it scandals but they don't even pay attention to it anymore it, it gains uh, an hour momentum on the internet and especially only by people like us from the info security field or cyber whatever you want to call it field but the normal people my neighbors I'm not saying that you guys aren't normal but <laughs> people yeah, knock on nico's door <laughs> Thanks, Dutch. <laughs> yeah. but, but the people next door, they don't even mind anymore. They're just like, well, this is Facebook. They're invasive, and we accept it. So I remember when I was creating a couple of uh, research accounts on Facebook one time uh, that, uh, you know, if you, you use a Gmail or a Yahoo Mail or something like that, um, then, then I, you know, it, it wouldn't ask for your password. It would send you that email confirmation or ask for a cell phone. But then on some mail systems like GMX, like Tutanota and all, it would actually ask you and say, hey, I know how to log into there to confirm that this is your username and password. Why don't you give me your username and password for your email site? This was months and months ago too. And, you know, personally, I was like, oh my God, that is, that is horrendous. But professionally, if I'm setting up a research account and I've got some targets that I want to find in Facebook, then maybe I do want Facebook to look into my email and pull out my contacts and stuff. Although I wonder if Facebook could go, you know, count the number of e emails that have ever been sent or received from this account and find out that I just created it. I'm that sorry. that actually we were just talking talking about in that, that in chat. GT says totally disagree uh, with this on Facebook. However, it would keep sock puppet accounts alive for longer if they knew you know your 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 password. And I I agree to a point, or whatever. But at the same time, like you, like you said, if you just created it and it doesn't have very much traffic in it, like it may be yet another uh, avenue for them to go through and say, hey, let's cut off this account because it's it's brand new and. You know, you're saying that you've been alive for 37 years at this point where you should have had Facebook. So, yeah, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword, I think. But it's true. I mean, if we can leverage their, you know, their password request or two-factor authentication or whatever they're claiming this as, you know, if we can leverage that and say, no, this is a good account. We need to keep this open. Then it may keep socks alive a little bit longer. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Sector? Yeah. Um. There's one, it's really nice that I want to uh, uh, have the password and look into the email. And even though Facebook said, no, we're not storing the information, um, around the same time, there were two really big news articles again about um, the data breaches. Um, one of them was uh, Cultura Collectiva, uh, a Mexican media company. And there was a second one that was an Amazon S3 bucket that was exposed. Um, that was from a Facebook app called At The Pool. So, again, hundreds and hundreds of millions of user information, uh, again, fully out in the open. And you never want to find your password in there. Didn't they just get, like, popped for saying that they kept a whole bunch of Facebook accounts, passwords, and clear text? I don't yes. know if it wasn't a breach or anything, but, like, if, if they're already with their own internal... Uh, chart creation or, or, or storage or tokenization of the, the passwords and stuff like that, and they're requesting more for systems outside their purview. Like, I don't understand why that would be a secure idea. And no, that, that, that's absolutely yeah. A breach was maybe not the right uh, choice of words. Um, but what struck me most is that it turned out earlier this month. It turns out that Facebook actually has subcontractors to store data too. They're not the only ones storing all the Facebook data. They have something like contractors or subcontractors that store data for them. So 
it's not just Facebook that you have to trust, but also all the other cheap companies that do all the data handling for them. And that's scary. Yeah, but now it's all, I think all eyes are on Facebook, but what are these other big companies doing? And I, I can only imagine those, those companies make the same mistakes because they all started back in the 90s where the internet wasn't as big as it was. There was no encryption on anything. It wasn't at least no one expected it to be. And all infrastructure shifts now more and more for being more encrypted and being kept better in better ways. And yeah, you have mistakes. And Facebook now gets best all the time, but I'm pretty sure some other big companies, which we haven't named, are doing exactly the same thing. True, true, but it's so much fun to bash fish. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's that's why, just... and that is why the uh, information uh, security part of my job is really nice. Yeah, and if you are Facebook and you're listening, I was kidding. It's not nice to bash you, but I mean, let's face it. You know, when when a large company does something wrong, it hits the headlines. When a lot of smaller companies do, it doesn't, um, because it affects less people too. Yeah, so, let's go ahead and wrap up our our bi week or two weeks in the news with this wonderful thing on deep fakes. Now, this is from July of 2018, talking about all of those deep fake videos where uh, jo I think this is Peel, right? Jordan Peel, it was moving his mouth and making Obama say things, and um, and now with uh, this person does not exist and all these other like amazing amazing AI things, uh, we've got some really interesting uh, problems with verification and validation. We can't just look at a video and go, well, yeah, it looks like him saying that. Um, what do y'all think about that? Yeah, I find it really worrying, just not being able to determine what's true and not. Uh, and we are people who do this on a day-in-day -day basis. So we, I think now we still can um, pivot into those data points which tell us this is true and this is not true, but there will be a moment which we can, we just can't filter out those fakes anymore because they're getting better and better. And I find it really worrying when certain countries are manipulating, let's say, satellite imagery or uh, yeah. imagery, video footage of riots and editing out certain badges or people for instance, as examples, I, I think this is the path we are taking at this moment where it gets disturbing. But well, we've been doing that for years, though. I mean, if you look back at, at books and newspapers, I mean, propaganda is propaganda, right? We, we can show, you know, a police officer beating somebody mm -hmm. on the street, but that's the cropped out piece. You don't see, you know, all of the other people behind the police officer that have been attacking him or her. Um, so it, we really, I mean, I think this is just an evolution of taking that propaganda, taking that, hey, now I can edit this 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 type of media to uh to its logical extreme of of now it's untrustable or less trustable um Ginsburg, what do you think so i i think i think two things are going to well i, I have two thoughts i should say uh, the first is that i believe this is going to make metadata even more important uh metadata research i think um you know being able to go through and kind of see how when and where it's uploaded if there's any tags um, even if it is geolocated or something else like that, however, but even if it's spoofed geolocated. So I think, I think it's going to make it go back to verifiable instances of what we can actually truly know um, to go through and kind of discern whether this is a fake or not fake. Um, the other thing is I wanted to bring up, did you guys see the article that uh, was talking about there was a, there was a malicious actor that actually was able to remove um, cancer like nodes in some of the CT scans and stuff like yes, that. Yes, they had they had introduced malware into the uh, radiological analysis system yeah. up in New England somewhere. I think it was, yeah. Uh, it was yeah. a research project. Yeah. yeah. So so this kind of goes along with that being is that it's not a deep fake, but the ability to uh, add or subtract um, vital information in regards to what's being seen. 
And since, especially in the American side, we're such a, a 24 hour like culture, once something goes 24 hours in the, in the news cycle, whoever, it's picked up by everybody, it's dispersed, and then it kind of dies down. Like what Dutch was saying, you know, it gets a, it gets a huge boost and then it kind of goes down, whatever. So if you can, if you can introduce those type of things like cancer research and things like that, or whatever, and nullify those or, or add to those, uh, it's, it sways opinion, which gets back into the information war type stuff. So it's, it's all on the visual spectrum, I think, but it's increasingly important to go through and know that these things are out there so that it's not just given as faith that these type of things work. So, yeah. Yeah, but, I think that's an important part is that, you know, this type of ability by consumers, I mean, this is not by, you know, uh, nation states, us having the ability to tamper with these videos now moves all of the videos into, well, that's suspicious. Even though it says something I don't want it to, or that that's a picture of something, it's probably a fake or it could be a fake and it may or may not be. Chris, what do you think? Any thoughts? Well, I, I've uh, been privy to some uh, very shocking uh, propaganda videos coming out of the uh, Russian troll factory uh, mm. from last year uh, with uh, things that have gone on in, in France and other places throughout Europe. And um, with the uh, deep fakes, it would get much better. For instance, uh, that particular troll factory had made a very poor looking video uh, about two years ago where they had um, a gentleman dressed up like a U.S. Army person, but all the patches, everything was incorrect. And they had that person shooting a Quran. And mm. then... Um, uh, very, very soon after, um, <clears throat> had, had was having sex with a Hillary Clinton lookalike, who didn't really look that much like Hillary Clinton. Okay. But um, and luckily, it, nobody really believed it. But now we've seen with uh, the deep fakes uh, putting celebrities in porn, right? Yep. So this type of stuff is just that that next evolution that is mm. extremely worrisome. So I, I agree with things like now having to cross verify and check things with different types of metadata, things that might be embedded into a video uh, and so forth, because it's uh, now a very interesting time. Yeah. Can I have, have you seen a deep fake kind of stuff in your find uh, your field of OSINT when it comes to uh, devices or internet connected apparatus? Uh, I have, yes, yes. Would that fall into the realm of like honeypots and all? That's or? what I was going to ask, yeah. Um, a, a little bit of a mix. So you've got uh, different types of honeypots and systems uh, that could uh, pop up and down for um, diversionary things uh, and also uh, lots of uh, the quick ability to make fake information look real to people. Um, and, and that's also very problematic. Yeah. Well, this is actually a good uh, point in time for us to shift the focus from news of the week to um, asking you more questions, if you're okay with that. Absolutely. Cool. Um, Nico, I believe you've got some questions that we've queued up for Chris. Yeah, I'm firing up my system. Um, yeah, well, uh, again, thank you for being on our Ocean Curious webcast. Um, um, I was really interested. It triggered me. It triggered a lot for me reading your book, um, uh, "Hack the World with OSINT." Hack is kind of hack. Um, um, it is a field that I don't know very much of, so that's what caught my real interest in wanting to learn uh, more details on searching on census or Shodan, for instance. Um, how did you get introduced to? open source intelligence and OSINT? Uh, I was introduced uh, pretty early on as a, a kid, actually. Uh, my family has a background in national intelligence and also one of my grandfathers was the head of Voice of America's Latin American operations during a very tumultuous time. So that was one of the ways of how I was introduced to a lot of this different type of, of, of stuff and how it was uh, used or could be used. Hmm, very interesting. And, and um, what would you like to learn when it comes to this type of, type of field? You know the Internet of Things stuff. What don't you know and do you want to learn? 
Well, I'm not much of a people person, believe it or not. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Because <laughs> you seem I, very personable here. <laughs> I, I, I don't even play multiplayer games. Um, <laughs> but do your research accounts play multi-purpose games? Uh, multi well, uh, well a, a few times, depending on like uh, looking up uh, fraud for second through Second Life and things like that uh, right. years ago. But uh, that was about it. But um, I'm not really used to uh, targeting... Um, people per se um, I'm, I'm used to targeting uh, machine systems and uh, larger bits of information and I, I do find it very interesting when I hear you folks uh, talk about uh, getting in with, with uh, various types of phone numbers and neighborhood searches and so forth uh, I usually approach those types of things by looking at like the Wi-Fi network in the neighborhood that can be seen on Wiggle or something like that. So uh, the people approach is very different, and that's something I would like to learn. Cool. Well, we can hang out. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, another question. Um, well, I've read your book. Uh, it's 90% census. Uh, what are, the, what are you, uh, sources do you use often besides census? Uh, well, I, I have a line of Chinese tools that I use, uh, which are very nice, which uh, look at the Internet in a slightly different manner and also uh, can reach a little bit more into the IP6 space, which is quite nice. And I also like drilling down into some of the alternate uh, types of quote-unquote dark web networks, so like I2P and so forth. Uh, beyond just the onion sphere, because there's so much more interesting stuff to see. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, there was like just something that and I2B and yeah. Yeah, there's just something that came out uh, recently, uh, like today on I2P, and just like a surface website that was saying, "Hey, here's some interesting ways of of looking at resources," and uh, just explaining that I can dig that up and throw it in the show notes but well, that's interesting so so your sphere of of what you what you like to pursue you know we we've talked on this uh webcast before about each one of us has at least one or two or three things that we that that is like osint oh, cool to us you know that i love usernames and and uh nico likes whatever Nico likes, I don't know, but um, <laughs> I'm sure he likes something. Um, but so uh, systems and IP addresses, domain names, that's kind of your sphere of, of what you like or no? Uh, that databases, uh, 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 vulnerable machines, uh, printers. I really like those. Yeah, uh, printers and on the internet. <laughs> well, not just that. If you can get inside a network, uh, some of the corporate uh, like all-in-ones and, and bigger things, especially with the HR units, will uh, still keep copies on hard drives, which can be quite yeah. juicy. Um, so yeah. I, I, I do like uh, uh, quite a few things. I, I get bored easily, so, so I have to keep learning. See. Well, I mean, that's a good problem to have. I, I remember a penetration test that I did one time inside of a uh, a company's network, and and we found the subnet that had all of the multifunction copier scanner printers on there, and we found the cache of all of the the images, and there were passport photos, yep. and there were pictures of people's body parts that they'd put on the scanner and print. I mean, some <laughs> of the stuff was good. Some of the stuff was unusable, but I have copies of it. No, um, but it, it, yeah, it, it really is amazing. Like you said, and since that, you know, many of these, especially business grade machines have, have a gigabytes worth of space and they will store the image until you log in with your, your enterprise account. You can get in there sometimes and find some really amazing things. Um, yeah. Cool. 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 Um, I have one more question, and after that, I would like to ask you if you would take us on a little hands-on presentation demo that you have prepared. But my last question is, um, what made you want to write two books? Well, I like to share my knowledge, and I uh, actually like to write, and I love pen testing students because on the side, I also teach a few uh, pen testing courses. Uh, IT, IoT, and ICS systems. And I thought it was a good way to share because I was really, I, I like Shodan, but I was uh, quite impressed with uh, Census as well. And then I also liked the uh, journey of my first book, looking into the Panama Papers law firm and so forth and trying to see uh, various things about political parties. So I, I wanted to show 
how you could use OSINT uh, to actually uh, find some very important things and also very important systems. Thank you. And cool. we always like people who like to share their knowledge. So that's why. You're, so um, from now, can I ask you, are you willing to share your presentation and share your desktop to the audience and take us into your world of open source intelligence, please? Take it away. Yes. Okay. Hopefully the demo guides work. Yes. 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 Okay. So now uh, yeah. I'm going to try to... Uh, keep the, the slide portion short, but to explain a little bit. And uh, what this is, is uh, I was just in Belgrade, and whenever I do a presentation, I, I can't give the same one twice. I get bored, so I have to localize things. And uh, so that's exactly what I did. So some of the tools that I used were Census, uh, and I also used uh, Netcraft uh, to also cross-verify some of the information that I was finding in Census because I don't always trust just one source. I like to get and cross-verify from two or more sources if possible. And then to look up uh, vulnerability information, uh, CVE details is a very good source. And then, of course, your regular internet connection. And hopefully, my Windows computer will not try to restart again for an update it is unable to install. So uh, the reason... Uh, that I, I uh, localized it a bit is because of the particular target that I was able to find in Serbia. And I, I do want to stress that almost every country or place that I go, I find similar or much worse things. So just to give you a brief introduction to what census is, it, um, it first began as a University of Michigan project uh, with a paper uh, written, an academic paper written for it. What it does is it can scan the visible internet and it allows you to be in a passive role so that you're not directly interacting. Uh, census has already done the work for you. Uh, that's very good if you don't want your target to know that they are actively being looked at. And another thing that it can do, uh, especially if you have your, your own uh, uh, setup, which you can actually download uh, the ZMAP project in its entirety from GitHub. Um, you can yourself scan the internet if you've got a 10 gigabit uh, connection in 10 to 15 minutes, which is quite cool. You can also use this on your internal network as well, by the way, if you set it up internally. And this part is uh, all uh, free. And there are limited uh, free usage accounts as well as security researcher accounts if you request one. But uh, like most products, uh, they charge something for the commercial version. I don't know. I don't use it for commercial purposes. So if you use ZMAP yourself, mm -hmm. then you've moved from doing OSINT to doing like reconnaissance where you're actively yes. scanning. And um, I had a... Uh, I had a, a previous employee that did this from an Amazon instance. He scanned the internet. Amazon was really not happy at no. the huge amount of traffic that came back through their pipe. So there are ramifications there, I think. You got to think of yes. that. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so like I said, uh, one of the things I did was I did some local research because I had not been to Serbia yet. I do have uh, uh, some Serbian friends but I didn't know that much uh, about the country. And so I was looking for the domain codes and also if what type of alphabets they use because sometimes you don't always find things on one particular alphabet or character set. You can use different character sets and domain names as well and over the internet. And of course, if there were any Serbian intelligence agencies. So uh, what I found was uh, a bit interesting. Uh, there is a Serbian intelligence agency called uh, the, basically the Serbian Information Agency. And I went ahead and took a look at uh, what was going on to see if I could find anything on their stuff using uh, census. So one quick thing, because I was going to be using different languages, I don't use uh, Google directly a lot, so I use DuckDuckGo Bangs uh, so that uh, Google doesn't directly track me. And you can actually go directly to the different languages. And because there were two different languages, it can be helpful for translation because I'm certainly not fluent in 
Serbian, right? Uh, I also don't like to directly uh, search for things like uh, country domain names. Sometimes I'll just use Wikipedia stuff so that, again, I'm not leaving too much of a fingerprint as well. And I went ahead and found uh, where the, for instance, government institutions, uh, what their uh, country code and everything would be. And then <clears throat> I went ahead and took a look uh, to see if, of course, there was a uh, intelligence agency. Luckily, Wikipedia, uh, here again, uh, gives me a wonderful list that I can go ahead and find uh, basically whatever I want out about uh, different countries without leaving a huge footprint by searching for intelligence agencies directly via Google. And uh, this is the security agency with a function very similar to the CIA or MI6 in the United Kingdom. So um, this is the general about census page if you want to know a bit more about the mission. And this is where you can download and uh, learn about all the different components of census. Chris, I'm mm -hmm. still seeing your, your slide deck. Oh. Right, is anybody okay. else still seeing your slide deck and not the screen? Yeah, still the slide deck. Okay. okay. Hold on. Archer, yeah. Yeah, you might need sure. to shift and share out that application. So I'm sorry for okay. interrupting you. Okay. Hold on. So if I go to Can you see that? ZMet project? Yep, we got it. Okay. All right. So this is a location where I can learn about all the different components of the ZMet project. Uh, if you want to know and uh, go ahead and download all of them. Uh, this is the information about the Serbian Intelligence Agency. This is Wikipedia, who gives you a lovely list, and here's all the information about the domains. Now, if I can go right here. What I went ahead and I did was, using the IPv hosts, I went ahead and did a general search under the gov.rs. Unfortunately, I didn't really find anything juicy. And I was a bit disappointed. So then what I did was I noticed that because they use the Cyrillic alphabet as well, that this is actually the top level domain for Serbia in Cyrillic. So then, sorry, the little menu keeps popping over when I, uh, when I uh, try to go to my tab. There we go. So by looking just at the top level domain here that I found on Wikipedia, the very first hit that I found was actually the Serbian Intelligence Agency. And instantly I was able to find a couple of things that looked a little odd for an intelligence agency, to be honest, which were these types of ports that were uh, actively in use for an intelligence agency. I would have expected to see something a bit different. And taking a look in the details, if the menu will go away, there we go. Um, inside the details, we can see uh, which networks it's running, which protocols it's running, and also census goes ahead and does the banner grab for us, uh, which is very nice, and also does the same thing for uh, the SMTP protocol and also tries to check to see if there's any existing uh, TLS encryption or something like that uh, that is present. In this particular case, there is no encryption certificate for the HTTP services, which that's all it's running. Uh, not uh, any HTTPS, and for the email system uh, for the BIA, there is no encryption um, currently available. Now, another thing that Census will do is if you go into a bit more details, it will go ahead and show you a table format so that you can find uh, the exact um, uh, properties that you might want to look for for your particular target. And then it will go ahead and not only grab system information, but also it will index part of the website information, just like Google would under normal circumstances. So you can actually search just under the uh, body to get certain information if you want just to pinpoint things. So uh, here again, I, I double checked and unfortunately uh, there is um, no encryption that is running and here's the HTTP body itself, which is not encrypted, which uh, shows all the metadata content and HTML code. 
Uh, you can also grab the raw data in a JSON format, which is quite nice because in the background, Census has a very nice API they can use with Python, or I prefer to use it with uh, PowerShell myself. And what's interesting is I will try to open PowerPoint again. We'll see. And I will share out this. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint? Nope. Okay, hold on. View, current slides. Now, share again. Okay. So, uh, in addition, uh, I wanted to uh, find if out uh, really quickly if I could find out any other information without directly contacting um, or, or touching uh, their systems uh, yet. So, this is what the screenshot looks like of what their main website looks like. Uh, luckily, Census also can pull this information down, which is quite nice. And uh, this is what I just kind of showed you. Uh, using the Netcraft, uh, what is this site running? Uh, if you put in uh, the English version, uh, Latin character version, it will actually pull up what the operating system is that is running and then cross verify that it's Windows uh, IIS 8.5. Oh, that's just a bigger version. Uh, it's pretty easy to find out, uh, for example, if you want to find an exploit or how to do exploitation on this particular version of IIS because it's been around for a little while. And if you want to find out pretty quickly if there are, uh, for instance, any major vulnerabilities that already have Metasploit uh, exploits available, which are pretty easy to run, uh, there's a I believe 32 or 37 available for this version of Windows Server. So you could theoretically try to, uh, for example, clone or, or uh, copy a lot of the settings, uh, run it in your own lab practice, trying to exploit it. And then when you're confident enough, go ahead and uh, hit the BIA uh, servers uh, to see what you could find. So this was a very uh, brief one. Uh, one I wanted to show as, as a small example and one other thing, if I can go back to the share, uh, where is it? There we go. Uh, census can do very far reaching things. So for example, if I didn't just want to uh, look at a uh, lack of encryption on an intelligence server, so one of the things I, I also like is uh, the idea of you know, encryption, decryption, and looking at things I shouldn't. For example, this particular pro protocol, uh, because Census goes ahead and scans the internet over a lot of different uh, ports, and uh, you can actually look for uh, broken um, or weak algorithms across the internet over various different types of things, so email, SQL. Uh, this is a uh, type of gateway where certain types of IoT devices would connect to called MQTT and so forth. These are some of my favorite, which are remote desktop ones. And you can actually uh, pinpoint in any of these areas uh, weak algorithms, which is, is quite nifty all across the uh, internet. And it's pretty widespread. So um, just a very short demonstration, but uh, one of the ways that I was able to find some of the other uh, intel agency finds I've, I've written about in the past was being able to uh, leverage uh, certain properties uh, within uh, Census because it's so quick and easy. So it's been a very uh, successful tool for me. Well, I'm impressed and I'm... Um more even more eager to learn even more about this type of uh, conducting OSINT. Um, would you say that you use this especially because you want to keep your own uh, OPSEC in mind also? Uh, absolutely and also uh, although I, I just showed you a, a 
presentation on uh, an intelligence agency, I wanted to make sure that before I go to Serbia, I wasn't directly contacting any of their machines, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I totally understand. Totally makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and that's a that's an important part too, because you know, with when we do open source intelligence uh, on people, we always talk about the research accounts or sock puppets that that kind of do things on our behalf, so that we can stay a little bit more private. Um, these in these sites, like you mentioned, with Netcraft and Built With and Census and Shodan, um, they do the scanning and recording many times of historical data uh, for us, so that we. We don't have to, and uh, it can speed us up. And uh, especially love, like you pointed out, you know, census, Shodan, they take screenshots of things or they record banners. So you can type in unauthorized government system or something in, in, one, in the field, and it'll show you all of those wonderful sites with that. Yes. Yes, so, it will. Yeah, well, I, I, I am impressed, and I, I always love learning more about learning deeper things about tools that – Right now, I kind of only use at the surface. So thank you very much for sharing that, really. Oh, thank yeah. you for, for letting me share. Yeah. Excellent. Well, um, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. We're just about an hour here. I uh, wanted to give you an oppor opportunity, Chris, to uh, share anything or uh, promote anything. If you're going to be in a place and you wanna, you're teaching a class, you're doing a talk, or you have a cause that you feel strongly about, please uh, let our audience know about it. Uh, Next week, I'll be in Berlin as an expert panelist on uh, renewable energy and microgridding to add cyber resiliency uh, as a guest of the German wow. government. <laughs> and in front of like 2,500 people and 48 ministers, and I hope I don't screw it up on stage and, you know, little things like that. Um, <laughs> and then right after... I'll be at uh, Space Command headquarters, and then immediately after that, I'll be in Washington, D.C., and then presenting on cyber warfare for uh, Security B-Sides Charmed Baltimore. Ah, uh, that's local to me. I wish I was going to that one you up there. You gotta go! Uh, you know what? I'm going to see if maybe I can... Uh... Maybe I can swing it. Maybe I can just go up there to say hi to you or something like that. I'll yeah, definitely. Seat. And then we'll have some Maryland blue crabs, man. There you go. With Old Bay. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Well, let's go ahead and round the, round the horn here. Uh, Ginsburg, do you have anything, any shout outs, uh, Sec KC or anything your way that you want to talk about? Uh, open OSINTS, uh, the Rocket Chats. Make sure you're checking that out because it's a really good resource. We just had like a huge influx of people, so I don't know why or how, but there's a bunch of people <laughs> joined. Is it you? It was, oh, I, 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 I always mention it in my in my classes. In the Sec Great international resource. It's good stuff. Um, yeah, B says Kansas City. Um, I'm doing the workshop out there uh, for OSINTS. So it's sold out, but if you're in the Kansas City or the Midwest area and you can get to B says Kansas City, uh, we're still doing the OSINT Village. Um, uh, yeah, come out, hang out. Uh, if anybody is looking to go through and sponsor stuff, uh, B sides is still looking for OSINT sponsor stuff. So, you know, get that stuff going. Right, uh, right. And then, yeah, set Casey for life. You know, all that. Cool. Nico? Um, next month, Science Amsterdam, the SEC 487 with Mr. Hoffman himself, Yay. and me as a TA. So I'm looking pretty looking forward to that, and um, nothing much. Else. Just look at my Twitter account, and I will tweet a lot of tips. And you you are doing a, a heck of a lot nowadays. So I enjoy watching what you're tweeting. Yeah, sector. You got any last words? No. Um. I've been way too busy, so there's nothing new uh, from my side. Just, well, we're recording this on a Sunday. Tomorrow, new week in OSINT. Um, lots of cool stuff coming out again. And just been busy with talks, talks, and more talks. Excellent. So before I go, uh, Ginsburg, do you have Chris Kubacko's book again that we can sh show on the screen? And I just give a little promotion. It's uh, Hack the World with OSINT uh, by Chris Kubeka, and we'll have a link to it. Ah, Nico's got one too. Uh, we've, we'll, we've got a, we'll put a link to it in the show notes that'll be on our OSINTCurio.us um, website. And uh, I'm Michael Hoffman. I am uh, really enjoying 
and thrilled I just finished uh, Sands Orlando or Sands 2019 in Orlando teaching a bunch of people about uh, OSINT and just learned that my class uh, SEC 487, SEC 487 is now on, on demand. So people all over the world don't have to wait for it. They can just go ahead and buy it and watch the videos. Listen to me drone on for hours and hours. It sounds delightful. More than we already do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just what we need. The world needs more mica. Congratulations, though. That's awesome. That, that's really amazing. And I know that you've been doing a lot to go through and get that class going. And it's, it's kind of the first of its of its kind in SANS and stuff. So as one person who is an OSINT, like making this a standardized thing, whatever, like, thank you. It's, it's really, really nice. Yeah. Well, it's been great for me. And like we were talking about with Chris and, and we've been talking about in other things. I like writing that class because it helped me learn things deeper. It, it spurred me to kind of follow, follow that. Well, I might get a question about this, so I could go ahead and, and learn more. That so. is all the anxiety that I have right now for the workshop coming up in April. That is everybody <laughs> right now. i like, I don't know all the answers, but it's, it's going to be okay. And I will take my back saw and everything. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, this has been the OSINT Curious webcast and podcast. We've enjoyed being here this last hour. Uh, big thanks again to Chris Kubeka uh, for joining us. And uh, we'd like to thank you for watching our, our show or listening to it wherever you are. Uh, once again, we want to remind you to stay OSINT Curious. I'm Mike Hoffman. See you in two weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.